This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. This episode contains explicit language. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Hey guys, before we start today's episode, I have a request. I'm looking for some original music for the show theme. And I know there are a lot of talented musical type peeps out there. And I'd love to get your music before over 100,000 people each month as of this writing. So if you're interested and think you have the perfect theme music for this show, please send me a clip at esther at truecrimepodcast.com. That's esther, E-S-T-H-E-R, at truecrimepodcast.com. Or message me on Twitter at Upon a Crime. And let's make it happen. Thanks. Today's episode is sponsored by audible.com. Get a free audio download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash once upon a crime. There are over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. I have a great suggestion for you. First, I need to thank journalist and author Jeffrey Tubin for his help in my research for this episode. He wrote an in-depth article for The New Yorker soon after the events of this case unfolded and pointed me to this great resource. So to return the favor, I'd like to suggest you get his new book, American Heiress, The Wild Saga of the Kidnapping, Crimes, and Trial of Patty Hearst. I'm reading it now, and it's an engrossing read. Whether you remember the story of the Patty Hearst kidnapping or not, this will provide you details that you've probably never heard before. It's truly fascinating. Just go to audibletrial.com slash onceuponacrime for your free audiobook and 30-day free trial. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We are in the series True Crime Game Changers, where I detail crimes that caused us to rethink or change the way we respond to crime. In the next two chapters, I will outline two cases that caused us to make changes to safeguard ourselves against one of the worst issues we face as a society, crimes against children. This is Chapter 3, Polly Class. Richard Allen Davis, 39 years old and a recent prison parolee, had been living at the Turning Point Shelter in San Mateo, California. The shelter served as temporary housing for the homeless in the San Francisco Bay Area. Davis had been paroled from the California Men's Colony in San Luis Obispo on June 27, 1993, having served eight years of a 16-year maximum sentence for kidnapping and robbery. Now on parole, he'd asked permission to visit his sister, who was living on the Coyote Valley Indian Reservation in Ukiah, about 150 miles north of San Mateo. He drove his white 1979 Ford Pinto there, on September 24, 1993. To get to Ukiah, Davis would have to drive north up Highway 101. About halfway to Ukiah, he would drive straight through Petaluma, California. Petaluma was a small bucolic town located in Sonoma County in Northern California and was home to some 45,000 residents. It boasted a charming downtown and had a small town feel. It did, however, serve as a transportation hub. There was a Greyhound bus station located in the middle of town where many people would make connections to other destinations. Close to the bus station was Wickersham Park. Wickersham Park was often frequented by transients who would drink and score drugs there. It's possible that Davis found this place on his way up to Ukiah. Petaluma was almost an exact halfway point between San Mateo and Ukiah. However it happened, Davis found himself back in Petaluma a mere five days after returning home to San Mateo, from visiting his sister. On October 1, 1993, Eve Nickel was living in Petaluma with her daughters, Polly, age 12, and Annie, age 6. Polly was Eve's daughter from her first marriage to Mark Class, who lived not far away in Sausalito, California, and was running a Hertz car rental franchise in San Francisco. He was close to Polly, and they spent many weekends together and talked on the phone almost daily. Annie's father, Alan Nickel, and Eve were separated at the time. Eve and her girls lived just across the street from Wickersham Park. October 1st was a Friday night, and Polly had invited some girls over for a slumber party. Two girls accepted the invitation, Jillian Pelham and Kate McLean, also both 12 years old. Jillian was the first to arrive, around 7 p.m. She and Polly got permission to walk to a nearby convenience store, they purchased popsicles and returned to Polly's house. On the way, they would have passed Wickersham Park. Later, they would wait in front of Polly's house for Kate to arrive. 
She was dropped off by her mother sometime between 8 and 9 p.m. As Kate's mother pulled out of the driveway, she saw a man wearing dark clothing with bushy gray and brown hair, carrying something that might have been a bag. Another neighbor, a 13-year-old girl, also saw the man. She had seen him get out of his car and walk down the same sidewalk near Polly's house. She also thought he was carrying a bag or a box. The man was Richard Allen Davis. He later would admit he'd been hanging out at Wickersham Park and had smoked some joints and drank at least a couple of quarts of beer that night. Meanwhile, Polly and her friends were inside the house in Polly's room playing. Halloween was only a few weeks away, and the girls were discussing what costumes they would wear and trying out outfits. Polly wanted to paint her face as part of her costume, and Jillian applied makeup for her that night. Polly was wearing a white cotton denim skirt and a pink blouse. Around 10 p.m., Polly's mother looked in on the girls and told them to keep the noise down. She and Annie were going to sleep in the master bedroom. Eve had a headache and took some pills to help her sleep. Both she and Annie soon fell asleep. The girls played video games in Polly's room. Another tenant lived behind Polly's house in a granny unit. He had a friend over that evening. The friend was outside the unit smoking a cigarette and saw a man in dark clothing with bushy hair on the back porch of Polly's home. It was about 10.30 p.m. Polly and her friends had decided to set up their sleeping bags. Polly opened the door to leave her room to retrieve her sleeping bag when she encountered a man standing just outside the bedroom door. He was holding a butcher knife and a bag. Don't scream or I'll slit your throats, he told the girls as he entered the room. He then said he wouldn't hurt them if they did what he said. He asked which of the girls lived in the house. Polly answered that she did. She also said that her mother and her sister were in the house. He seemed surprised to hear that there were others in the house. He then asked where the valuables were kept. Polly said there was some money in a jewelry box and asked him not to hurt her mother and sister. He repeatedly said he was not going to hurt anyone, but was just doing this for the money. He told all three girls to lie down on the floor of the bedroom. He tied their hands with pieces of silky type cloth material, cords he cut from the Nintendo machine, and the strap from a purse he found in Polly's room. He also gagged them with strips of the cloth. He then took the pillowcases he found in the room and put them over the girls' heads. He told the other two girls that he was going to take Polly so she could show him where the valuables were. He told them to count to 1,000, and he would be gone by then. The girls counted for a few minutes, but when Polly didn't return, they began to work to free themselves. They went to Polly's mom and told her what had happened. They all looked for Polly, but she was gone. Eve Nickel called 911 at 11.03 p.m. Contrary to what Davis had told the girls he was there for, he didn't take money or anything else from the house except Polly. The police soon arrived and didn't find much evidence to go on. The FBI was called since this was an abduction. They took the rug from the bedroom, and a palm print was later found on the bed frame. Jillian and Kate were taken to the police station, and a sketch was made of the intruder. An all-points bulletin was released. Searches were conducted of every home nearby, and helicopters and bloodhounds were also called into the search. Neighbors were interviewed, with many reporting having seen the man in dark clothing with bushy hair between 9 and 10.30 that evening near Polly's house. However, the APB that the Petaluma police put out for Polly and her abductor was marked not for press release. As a result, the Sonoma Sheriff's dispatcher never announced it on the police radio channel, since reporters monitored this open channel. The police department later stated that they mistakenly believed that such bulletins were immediately broadcast through other means to all police officers in the area. If this had happened, would Polly's fate have been different? We may never know but it is much more likely that Davis would have been apprehended just hours after her abduction. At about 11 p.m. that evening, a property owner, Dana Jaffe, who lived on a 192-acre parcel of land about 25 minutes north of Petaluma, got word of a trespasser on her property. She had just returned home from work and relieved her babysitter. As the woman was driving down the road headed home, she saw Richard Allen Davis hunched over the rear of his car. It was wedged against an embankment and seemed to be stuck in a ditch. She stopped her car, and as he approached, she noticed he had bad breath and body odor. She saw leaves and brush embedded in his hair. She asked him what he was doing, and he told her he was stuck and needed some rope. 
She called him illiterate for not reading the signs that this was private property. He put his hands on top of her car near her window and told her to get out. What's up the road, he demanded of her. She told him there were people up the road who would call the police. Then she drove off. She was frightened by the man's demeanor, and she worried that he might go up to Dana's house. She and her daughter were there alone. So she drove to the nearest payphone to call her and warn her about the scary guy on the hill. She told her to call the police. It was 11.24 p.m. Dana then drove down the road herself and saw the car in the ditch, but didn't see anyone on the road. She called the police at 11.46 p.m. About 15 minutes later, two Sonoma County Sheriff's deputies arrived in separate cars to the property on Pythian Road. They had not received any information about Polly's abduction at this time. They encountered Davis leaning against his car smoking a cigarette. When they questioned him, he said he was driving from Oakland on his way to see a relative in Redwood Valley and pulled off the roadway to do some sightseeing when his car got stuck in the ditch. The police officers noted that he smelled of alcohol and was sweating profusely, even though it was a chilly night. He said he'd tried to place brush and debris under the tires to get some traction, but they did not note anything under the tires. One of the deputies ran the license plate number. The car had recently been purchased from a friend and was not registered to Davis yet, but the officer transposed some of the numbers, so this did not come up. In fact, no information came up since the officer had entered the information incorrectly but he decided not to rerun the plates. Davis told him he was not on parole and had never been to prison. They ran his driver's license number, but it didn't come up with any outstanding warrants. The computer system they had access to did not show criminal history. They had searched his vehicle, finding a few unopened beer cans and some bags with clothing. While one of the deputies went to borrow a chain to pull the car out of the ditch, Davis seemed relaxed, even opening up one of the beers and beginning to drink it the deputy told him to pour it out. They then helped him pull his car out of the ditch and escorted him down the road and back to the freeway. It was 12.46 a.m. Meanwhile, back in Petaluma, searchers were out in force looking for Polly. Within two days after her abduction, over 600 volunteers had showed up for the search. The Coast Guard had 300 cadets searching the waterways near Petaluma. The Napa River flows through the town. Over 50 FBI agents, local police officers, and 300 search and rescue personnel were called in. More than 100,000 flyers with Polly's photo and a sketch of the kidnapper were posted in the first few days, but all to no avail. Polly had disappeared. In the weeks that followed, publicity about Polly's disappearance grew. People magazine picked up the story and printed a front-page account, dubbing Polly America's Child. Mark Klass took a leave from his job and ran the search headquarters night and day. David Collins, whose own son Kevin had disappeared in 1984 and was one of the first missing children to be featured on a milk carton, called to offer his assistance. But as the week stretched on with no leads, interest began to wane. It was then that actress Winona Ryder, who was a native of Petaluma, offered a $200,000 reward for the return of Polly Klass. Polly's disappearance was then featured on America's Most Wanted, and her story continued to be updated on five separate episodes. Polly Class's disappearance was the first missing child story to be carried in real time on the internet. The FBI was pursuing leads that Polly had run off with a boyfriend, a ludicrous theory since Polly was a 12-year-old child that had never had a boyfriend, and her abduction by a stranger, who was an older man, was witnessed by her two friends. They then theorized that Polly's abduction had perhaps been staged by her and her friends. Polly's parents were incensed and thought pursuing these theories was a waste of time. Polly's father, Mark, was given a polygraph test and passed it. The investigation seemed to be at a standstill until two months later when Dana Jaffe was walking along her property near the place where Davis's car had been stuck. There, she found a condom, duct tape, a large sweatshirt, a pair of tights, some white cloth strips, and a pillowcase with makeup smudges on it. She called the sheriff and reminded him about the man they'd questioned the night of Polly's abduction. They now tracked down Davis at his sister's home in Ukiah, and they arrested him for a parole violation on November 30th. He'd had a warrant issued against him for a drunk driving arrest in Mendocino County on October 19th. After his arrest, Petaluma police officers and FBI agents 
questioned him about Polly's kidnapping. He denied any knowledge of the crime. Two days later, on December 2nd, criminalists matched Davis to the palm print found in Polly's room. A Petaluma police sergeant had previously encouraged Davis to talk to him if there was any chance Polly could still be alive. After being confronted with the palm print evidence, he asked to talk to the sergeant. On December 4th, Davis called him and said, I fucked up big time. He admitted that Polly was dead and agreed to help them find her body. Later that evening, Davis led the Petaluma police sergeant, FBI agents, and a Sonoma County District Attorney's investigator, along with other officers, to Detcher Creek Road, located about 100 feet away from Highway 101, just south of Cloverdale, California, about 40 miles north from the spot the deputies had helped him out of the ditch. Polly's body was badly decomposed. It lay under a piece of plywood and other debris. Her remains were partially covered by a nightgown. The nightgown was inverted and pulled up under her arms. Her white skirt had been pulled up to her chest, and she was still wearing her bra and panties. Her body seemed to be positioned on her back, not thrown haphazardly. A piece of rope and a knotted cloth located nearby were entwined with some of Polly's hair. The medical examiner reported that the cause of Polly's death was unascertainable because of the condition of the body, but that the rope and knotted cloth could have fit around Polly's neck and might have been used to strangle her. The FBI's evidence response team examined the remnants of Polly's clothes and, using an alternative light source, discovered a fluorescence that indicated the presence of semen. Davis was interviewed and told his version of events. He said he was in Petaluma to look for his mother to ask her for some money on October 1st. He said he could not find her and then went to the park where he began to drink beer and smoked a marijuana cigarette that might have contained PCP. He said he didn't have a clear memory of what happened next. He had never seen Polly class before, he insisted, but now he found himself in her room. He remembered tying up the three girls, but then said he only recalled driving and only realized the girl was in the car when she complained that the bindings were too tight and her hands were going numb. He said he drove around for a while and then got lost going up Pythian Road, where his car got stuck. He said he untied Polly and placed her up on an embankment, telling her to keep quiet, while he went back to the car to try and free it. He said she was up on the embankment and waited the whole time he was with the deputies. After they left, he claims, he went and retrieved Polly, then stopped at a gas station so she could use the restroom. Afterwards, he realized that kidnapping Polly would send him back to prison, so he strangled her with a piece of knotted cloth and then drove to a spot to hide her body. After researching this case and hearing Davis's version of events, I have to agree with the investigator's conclusions that Davis lied about hiding Polly on the embankment. I remember hearing this detail when Polly's body was discovered and the story he gave came out. I remember feeling sick, thinking, why didn't she run away or cry out? Maybe she could have been saved. But after really learning the facts of this case, I have to believe that, tragically, Davis assaulted and murdered Polly before the police even arrived. It wouldn't make sense to hide her on the hill, be discovered by the babysitter and then the police, and then take a chance to retrieve Polly, take her to another area, and assault and kill her. And he was already back in his car trying to free it from the ditch before he assaulted her? It doesn't make sense. More likely, he stopped at that spot not realizing it was private property, and took Polly up to a secluded place off the road, assaulted and killed her before returning to his car, and realizing then that he was stuck. That's when he was discovered by the babysitter. After he was let go by the deputies, by his account, he waited 30 minutes up the road before retrieving Polly, and then taking her to a gas station, seen by no one, by the way, and then decided he had to kill her. So we're supposed to believe that Polly sat silently the whole time while the deputies were with Davis, and then 30 minutes more after they escorted him away down the road? That's very unlikely. He probably did wait for 30 minutes after the deputies left. Then he snuck back onto the property to retrieve her body, where he then transported it and hid it in Cloverdale. He most likely knew that the property owner might continue to investigate, which he did, finding the other items he left behind and then discover the body. Davis, however, would not admit to sexually assaulting Polly, 
even when confronted with the FBI's evidence that pointed to that conclusion. They couldn't definitively say that a sexual assault had taken place, but believed it to be so. While Davis seemed ready to confess to the kidnapping and the murder, he would continue to maintain that he never sexually assaulted Polly. Investigators believe this was because Davis knew that child rapists were especially reviled in prison and he would be targeted once he was incarcerated. He also seemed to try and reject the label of child killer. He would say he thought Polly was older and continue to call her that broad when answering questions. Polly was 4 foot 10 inches tall and weighed only 80 pounds. She looked like a 12-year-old child. Investigators again believe this was a tactic due to Davis's concern about being labeled a child killer or molester. Davis was convicted on June 18, 1996, of first-degree murder and four special circumstances, robbery, burglary, kidnapping, and a lewd act on a child. At his sentencing, he made a statement, still denying he'd sexually assaulted Polly. I would also like to state for the record that the main reason I know that I did not attempt any lewd act that night was because of a statement the young girl made to me when walking her up the embankment. Just don't do me like my dad. I have to pay my dues, so should you. Burn in hell, Davis. All right, that concludes the statement. Davis implied that Polly was afraid he'd molest her like her father did. The courtroom let out a collective gasp while another person yelled out, Burn in hell, Davis. This, everyone knew, including the court, was an evil lie that Davis tried to use to deflect blame from himself once again. Mark Class sat stunned for a moment before he lunged up out of his chair and was intercepted and guided out of the courtroom while he yelled profanities at his daughter's killer. After this display by Davis, Judge Thomas C. Hastings sentenced him to death, saying, This is always a traumatic and emotional decision for a judge. You've made it very easy today by your conduct. Davis was sentenced to die by lethal injection and now awaits execution at San Quentin State Prison's death row. A public service was held for Polly Class, and 1,500 people came to honor her memory. Joan Baez sang Amazing Grace. Linda Ronstadt also performed. George Lucas designed the lighting for the altar. Senator Dianne Feinstein and Governor Pete Wilson read eulogies. Wilson said, We cannot call ourselves a civilized society if our children aren't safe even in their own bedrooms. The abduction and murder of Polly Class struck a nerve across the country, and parents, legislators, and law enforcement personnel sprang into action to make meaningful changes to help protect the most vulnerable citizens, our children. Polly became a symbol of the anger and outrage people felt about violent crime that seemed to plague the country. This became especially true after the facts of Davis's criminal history came to light and at how many times he had been charged with violent crimes, only to be set free time after time. Richard Allen Davis was a lifelong lawbreaker beginning his criminal career at the age of 12. His first arrest was for stealing checks from his neighbor's mailboxes. Davis was one of five children born to a Native American mother and a Caucasian father. His parents divorced when he was 11. Both parents were alcoholics. His father, Robert Davis, a longshoreman, was given custody of the children. The court record stated the reason, quote, because of the mother's alleged immoral conduct in the presence of the children. Davis's own sentiments towards his mother are clear. He calls her that gutter snipe dog bitch. The children were often farmed out to Davis's maternal or paternal grandparents. Probation reports from the time Davis began to get in trouble comment on his chaotic and unsatisfactory home situation. Neighbors in the small rural town of La Honda, where Davis lived with his father and siblings, say he began to exhibit bizarre behavior around the age of 11, first abusing and killing animals. Davis himself reports that at the age of about 12, he, quote, decided not to care anymore. He dropped out of school in the ninth grade and began drinking heavily. After that, he had constant arrests for petty thefts, residential burglary, dealing stolen property, public drunkenness, and disorderly conduct. Exhibiting his not-caring attitude, when he was arrested, he would frequently admit to other crimes he hadn't even been charged with. This behavior continued into his early 20s. In 1974, at the age of 21, Davis served his first prison sentence. 
he received a sentence of six months to 15 years for attempted burglary. The parole board, citing his youth and nonviolent nature of the offense, granted him parole after he'd served only one year. Just seven weeks after his release from prison, Davis kidnapped a woman named Frances Mays from a BART station parking lot in Hayward, California, at Knife Point. He forced her into the passenger seat and drove off with her in her car. He pulled into a deserted area and exposed himself, telling her that she knew what he wanted her to do. He was still pointing the knife at her. She grabbed it by the blade by one hand, yanking open the car door handle with the other. She managed to hold the knife just long enough to get out of the car and ran screaming. A passing car happened to be driven by a California Highway Patrol officer. He drew his gun on Davis and arrested him. Davis attempted to hang himself while in jail. He was then sent to Napa State Psychiatric Hospital. After three months there, he escaped. He spent five days on a crime spree. He broke into a home and assaulted the homeowner, hitting her over the head with a fireplace poker before leaving as she screamed. He next broke into the Napa Animal Shelter, stealing a gun, ammunition, and drugs. Using the stolen weapon, he attempted to kidnap a woman in a parking lot, but she managed to run away. He traveled to his former hometown of La Honda and burgled a home. Investigating the burglary, officers found Davis hiding in the backyard of the home and he was arrested. Davis was charged with kidnapping, assault, receiving stolen property, and possession of a gun. Because California's prisons were no longer concerned with rehabilitation of prisoners and instead was focused on punishment, sentencing guidelines were now rigidly set. Each offense had a specific amount of time to be served attached to the crime, and parole would be automatically granted once the time was completed. Under these determinate sentencing guidelines, Davis was given the maximum amount of time allowed, six years, even though a judge reported feeling troubled that Davis, when asked, said he felt no remorse for his crimes. It doesn't bother you at all, the judge asked. Davis replied, if it did, I wouldn't have done it. Davis was released after serving his full sentence of six years in March of 1982. Shortly after being released from prison, Richard Allen Davis met a woman and fell in love. Davis met Sue Edwards at St. James Infirmary, a popular restaurant and bar in Mountain View, California. Just a quick aside here. When I was researching this episode, I learned that bit of information and was taken aback. You see, I used to work at St. James Infirmary as a bartender. Not as far back as when Davis and Sue would have met, but a few years later. St. James Infirmary was a fixture here in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's located just down the street from the gates of Moffett Field Naval Air Station, now closed. But back in the day, St. James was filled with military personnel and bikers. It could be quite a tough crowd, but very lively, and the tips were good. Anyway, that's my personal connection to this story. But it's telling that he met Sue there, as you'll see as I continue the story. Sue Edwards was dealing drugs when she met Davis, specifically crank, a methamphetamine. She was in her early 20s, but looked much older. Her attorney, the former California State Representative Pete McCloskey, said she was what you'd call a motorcycle mama. Davis and Edwards had a Bonnie and Clyde existence, McCloskey says. They traveled together around Northern California, Oregon, and Washington, stealing and also dealing drugs. Davis now began to rob restaurants, stores, and even banks. In 1984, Davis and Edwards robbed a woman who they knew, Selena Verich. She was the former roommate of Edwards' sister. They traveled to her home in Redwood City, California, drew a gun on her, and threatened to kill her and her whole family if she didn't do as they told her. Davis pistol whipped her. They then forced her to go to her bank and withdraw $6,000 and give it to them. Having robbed someone who could identify them, they left the area heading up to Washington State. Once there, they robbed a bank, getting away with about $4,000. They continued to rob stores and at least one more bank. Four months after the assault and robbery of Selena Verich, they were pulled over in Modesto, California for a broken taillight. The officer ran a check on them and found the outstanding warrants for the kidnapping and robbery, and they were arrested. Davis was once again given the maximum sentence he could receive under the guidelines, this time 16 years. He was not charged with the other crimes he had committed with Edwards, roughly a three-year crime spree. He was charged with one other attempted robbery in Modesto and given a three-year term, but it was to run concurrently with his longer sentence. 
he was sent to the California men's colony in San Luis Obispo. At that time, inmates could earn as much as a third of their time off of their sentences for good behavior. But the prison population in California had grown to such an extent that prison overcrowding was a serious problem. So in 1983, the legislature passed a law that said inmates could now get half of their sentences off for good behavior. This is exactly what happened to Davis. He was released after only serving eight years on June 27, 1993. Ninety days later, he kidnapped and murdered Polly Class. Once the public learned how Davis had been released early from prison, even as his crimes became increasingly violent, and even after a probation officer wrote in his report, this man should be removed from the community. His propensity for crime and what appears to be an accelerating potential for violence dictates prison commitment. There was an outcry against letting violent criminals back out on the streets. A three-strikes-and-you're-out law had been proposed for a couple of years. But now, with the Polly Class case at the forefront of the news, it gained new momentum. Three-strikes laws, as they were more commonly called, had been enacted in some states to deal with habitual criminals. Designed to give longer prison sentences to repeat offenders who had been previously convicted of two prior serious offenses— Three strikes laws were being increasingly lobbied for by law enforcement and citizens alike. Now in California, the race was on to get the proposed law onto the November 1994 ballot. On October 1st of that year, 20,000 of the 385,000 signatures needed for the initiative had been gathered on petitions. Polyclass search centers were now turned into headquarters for the coordination and distribution of three strikes petitions. The signatures were quickly gathered. Proposition 184, California's Three Strikes Initiative, was passed by an overwhelming majority, with 72% of the population in favor. That year, 12 more states passed three strikes laws. By 2004, 26 states and the federal government had laws that met the general criteria for designation as three strikes statutes, namely that a third felony conviction would bring a sentence of 25 years to life, where 25 years must be served before the offender would become eligible for parole. But no state chose to adopt a law as sweeping as California's. While most other states limited strikes to specific crimes, the most violent crimes, California merely set the bar at serious offenses, which were often nonviolent in nature. Mark Klass, while originally a big supporter of the original three strikes law, withdrew his support when he discovered the law would apply to nonviolent offenders as well. In effect, a person could be sentenced to a 25-year-to-life term on a third strike for a nonviolent offense like theft if he'd previously had two violent or serious offenses. The third strike did not have to be violent or serious. The law would continue to be controversial in California, with the result being a drastic reduction of power of the three strikes law in California with the approval of Proposition 36 in 2012. The new law required that the third offense had to be a serious or violent felony to be considered eligible as a third strike. The new law passed with 69% of Californians approving. Holly Class's abduction and murder also brought the plight of missing children even more into the national spotlight. After 1994, 15 more states soon adopted sex offender registries to help community members and law enforcement officers identify where a paroled sex offender was living. This would eventually pave the way for Megan's Law. The Polly Class Foundation, started by Mark Class to help families of other missing children, was one of the first to aggressively use computers to transmit information and images of missing children across the country. Its procedures for searching for missing children and supporting their families became a model for many other search efforts. All points bulletins were changed to include not only highway patrol channels, but are now broadcast on all police channels. Mark Class married his longtime girlfriend in 1994 and continued his work with the Polly Class Foundation. Now 64, Mark Class still lives in Sausalito with his wife Violet. He is now the founder and director of the Class Kids Foundation and continues his work to help the families of missing children. Eve Nickel reconciled with her husband Alan and moved to Calistoga with her daughter Annie soon after Polly's death. Nickel now resides in Monterey County and lives a private life although she is still a board member with the Polly Class Foundation. Polly's sister Annie is now a writer living in New York. Polly's two friends who were at her slumber party that night are now grown women. 
Kate McLean is a Bay Area journalist and documentary filmmaker. Gillian Pallum, a dual citizen of Great Britain, is a lawyer living and working in England. Gillian says she travels to Petaluma every year to visit family and friends, and when she is there, she walks past Polly's former home and remembers her friend with the curly brown hair and the big smile. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. On our next episode, I will conclude the series True Crime Game Changers with a story about a crime that, while never solved, helped to rescue many missing and abducted children. I hope you'll join me then. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Special thanks to our research assistant, Sarah Villarreal, and production assistant, Nancy Chen, for their help with this episode. You can connect with me on Twitter at Upon a Crime and on Facebook and Instagram at Once Upon a Crime Pod. And we now have a new fan page on Facebook. Check it out. Until next time, be good to one another.